Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's OWL seminar. We're delighted to host Anupam Das from the University of Birmingham, who's been working uh, for a few years now on cyclic proofs. And it's a fascinating area, and we're going to find out about what cyclic proofs are, how they're related to inductive proofs, and the details of Anupam's research. Um, a few points about the OWL seminars before we begin. Uh, the sem first of all, the seminars being recorded, uh, but you will only be on the recording if you directly participate by asking a question. Um, questions uh, and interruptions are uh, absolutely welcome. Uh, these seminars are at their best when they're interactive. So if you have uh, a question or a clarification or an interesting point that you want to contribute, please use the raise hand feature in the participants menu. And then uh, if we have enough time, I'll interrupt Anapam and you'll be able to ask your question. Um, we encourage you to keep your audio and video, sorry, not your audio on. Uh, we encourage you to keep your video on. This helps everybody see who's around. It gives the seminar a bit more of a feel of a physical seminar where we can look over our shoulders, see who's around. Um, and then at the end of the seminar, we'll have questions in the usual way, and then we'll break in for, for a just uh, informal uh, conversation with each other. And of course, with Anna Power, if there's more points we want to uh, continue to discuss. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Anna Pam. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you to all the OWLs organizer for the invitation. It's, it's wonderful to be able to speak to uh, so many people about my research. Um, and I know this is uh, meant to be a fairly broad uh, uh, seminar series. So, I, um, while there are some details in this talk, I, I want to more focus on some of the big picture, and in particular, try to give a little bit of an idea of uh, the context in which I'm operating. And psychic proofs are by no means a, a new subject. They've been around for a while, and there are so many people working on so many interesting things. Um, but before we do that, maybe uh, no one has seen, maybe there are some people who haven't seen uh, any psychic proofs or example of non-well-founded reasoning um, that aren't fallacious. So uh, let's have a look at a particular argument that I'm sure most of you have seen before. It's the irrationality of square root of two by an infinite descent argument attributed often to Fermat. So uh, I'm going to write it in a formal sense. So I'm going to speak over this. So if you're not comfortable with formal proofs, don't worry. I'm going to speak over this in a way that's uh, in natural language. Um, so I think you can see my cursor. Um, is that correct? Yes, we can see your cursor. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so reading from the bottom, which is a good way to read it, I'm trying to show that for every uh, two numbers, x and y, uh, positive integers, uh, the square of x is not equal to 2y squared, right? This is equivalent to saying um, root 2 is not rational. So I say by contradiction, suppose you have an a and a b such that a squared equals 2b squared. Well, I have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and I know 2 is prime. So I can find um, a factor of, of a. a must be even. Uh, and it must be able to be divided by two and give me this x, uh, such that a squared equals two b squared. And uh, let's call that c, the factor. And now I can rephrase it, for c squared equals two b squared, I can divide by two, and I get something like this, b squared equals two c squared, and I can just repeat the argument. So where I've marked this by bullet, and where I've marked this by bullet, notice that the conclusions are equivalent up to renaming the variables. And so I claim I can just repeat the argument. And if you look at this um, structure, a priori, it looks like a non well founded uh, bit of reasoning. Now, of course, we can see it for what it is. We can see it that it is a sound argument and there's some sort of induction involved. Um, but the content of this talk and content of a lot of work on psychic proofs is to understand precisely uh, why we're able to write structures like this in a sound way and that we know that they're sound while other ones are not sound. So can I just ask a quick question? So are you saying this is a cyclic proof, but it's not an inductive proof? Um, you... As presented, I presented it as a cyclic proof. So it's a normal final proof, and I said, in the sense I've said, repeat the argument. Now, it turns out that it's also cyclic in the sense that it's only got finitely many distinct subtrees up to remain renaming of variables. Um, and that's sort of the sort of loop going from this bullet to this bullet. Um, and it turns, and of course, we, we know we can write such an argument in terms of induction, um, but it takes a little bit more work to write out. And I'm advocating writing it out in this way, or at least given as an example and a representation 
as a nominal founded derivation um, and asking if we can sort of distill some of the nominal founded derivations which do comprise sound reasoning from the ones that are clearly fallacious. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, do that. So um, let me say a little bit about cyclic proofs. And um, like I said before the talk, um, there are many distinct communities now studying nominal founded reasoning. Um, and my personal experience with it is of course very biased and very personal. So, but I just want to point out some of the things that I've been aware of in the literature. Um, and one nice way to look at it is you can see people, um, you can distill it by the subject matter. So you can think of people who work on algebra and type systems, for example, linear logic or Pliny algebra I've worked on um, and extensions, uh, modal logics, um, for example, the new calculus, which is one of the celebrated uh, subject matters in this area, um, predicate logics, for example, first logic and inductive definitions, and also arithmetic, which is what this talk is about. Um, and one nice thing about seeing it in this way is if you just look at the expressivity of the formulas in standard semantics, um, they're actually increasing left to right. So the things you want to say about the various subject matters will be different um, because of the increasing expressivity. Um, now, I will give, I'll try and make the slides available afterwards um, so you can dig into these references, but I don't want to go through, I mean, as you can see, there are many, and it's only a selection of the work that I'm aware of. The one thing I will, I have just highlighted here in blue is this, uh, I think, seminal paper by Nowinski and Balikiewicz um, from the uh, mid 90s, which, um, I feel really kicked off the area of circular proofs. And in it, it's the paper is called Games for the New Calculus, um, where they give a, a complete analytic cyclic system for the modal new calculus, uh, which eventually led to its um, completeness proofs for Cosin's optimization. Um, and as you can see, that's the earliest chronologically as well. Many of the other papers came afterwards. And one thing that prevails in many of these distinct communities, many of these different subject matters, is the following question, which is sometimes colloquially referred to as the brotherston simpson conjecture, which is, are cyclic proofs and inductive proofs equally powerful? Um, now, this is quite a vague, and when they wrote it, they meant a very, very precise thing. But um, the allusion to this conjecture, to this question, is intentionally vague because the way you interpret equally powerful or the subject matter, the logics in, in question, uh, give you actually a wide variety of ways to interpret this question. Um, and in the different subject matters, the significance has different applications. So for the modal mu calculus, like I said, the significance of that question um, comprises the completeness proof for Cosin's axiomatization of the mu calculus. Um, in the other areas, it has different applications. So I think one should think of this question more as a sort of program of research in itself. Um, what does answering this question in different settings tell us about those settings? Adam Pam, if you don't mind, I have, a, I have another question. Um, on the previous slide, um, if you could just go back to it quickly, you, you talk about non-well-founded reasoning. Now, that, um, at, the, at the end of the day, surely we don't want non-well-founded proofs, either in, inductive or cyclic, right? The, the proof that you gave uh, on the slide before this one was a cyclic proof that was perhaps not necessarily well-founded, but in fact is well-founded, which we know for other reasons. Right, so, so let's distinguish two different uh, yeah. uses of the word well-founded. I mean, we could, we could even talk about cyclic proofs that are not well-founded at all, right? But we're not interested in those, are we? We're interested in cyclic proofs that are in fact... So, okay, when I say uh, well-founded in this talk, I really mean the data structure. So if you look at this as an infinite tree, they really mean that this, this, this thing as a data structure is non found. It has an infinite path. So you can think of the conclusion is justified by this premise, this, prem this formula is justified by these two, this one is justified by this, and this is justified by this, and there's an infinite descending chain of justifications. So I really mean in that sense. Uh, okay, such a data structure can, at the end of the day, actually be well-founded for other reasons, like terminating in, in, in every instance, or not. Right. Uh, yes, there's another, um, yes, in, in some senses, these things will be well-founded in the sense that they're, uh, they're not fallacious, right? That they, 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 there is some well-founded uh, reasoning going on in, in but I think in an, in an abstract sense. So when you um, say, okay, so when you talk about a cyclic proof, and when you say are cyclic proofs and inductive proofs equally powerful, are you just talking about those cyclic proofs that happen to be well-founded, 
or, or not. You're talking about psychic proofs as a whole, regardless of whether there's some independent proof of well found. So I've not yet given the complete definition here, but uh, there's, uh, the idea is that there will be a particular condition that will impose on these non well founded proof trees. Um, that will ensure that everything that derived is derived as sound it is is indeed valid. Okay. And, and then when we, when the question of um, whether inductive and psychic are equally powerful is specialized to that class of non well founded proofs. Thank you. That's clear. Okay. Okay. But this is a good question. Yeah. So um, I, I mean, I so, I'm sort of intentionally uh, um, using this word what uh, non well founded. So usually when we say well founded in mathematics, we just mean it's it's a sound argument. Right? Here I really am referring to the the tree being non well founded. Okay, um, so um, this is, uh, so I think this is a really deep question, and I think um, another the final parameter I'll say is um, when we interpret equally powerful, um, this can have different levels of refinement. So, do they prove the same theorems is one way of, of interpreting it, but do they prove the same theorems with proofs of the same size? Do they see, prove the same theorems with uh, invariants of the same complexity? Um, and I think. Um, all these different questions give us different insights into uh, what's going on. Now, I started out as a sort of mathematical proof theorist, and for me, the natural setting uh, for talking about such questions was piano arithmetic. In arithmetic, we have very, very well understood uh, delineations of expressivity of proofs, and so we can really use this setting to actually formally analyze the strength of cyclic reasoning. So I better actually present some definitions of what I'm working with. Um, I've intentionally tried to avoid that till now because the definitions are a little bit um, tricky to get your head around if you have not seen them before, but I'll try to show an example to uh, make it clear. So firstly, if you've not um, seen piano arithmetic as a formal theory, you've probably heard of it, um, let's just pin down some of the basics. So we have um, a very, very simple language. The language uh, consists of zero, successor, so it just adds one, uh, addition, multiplication, and I include an inequality symbol in the setting. Um, and you can formalize Piano arithmetic in, as a sequence calculus. So um, you have some simple initial sequence or axioms defining these non-logical symbols. This is Robinson's Q, so these are very, very simple axioms. And the most important feature is the induction rule, which gives us access to inductive reasoning in arithmetic. Um, so this is, uh, if I read it in natural language, it's just saying that if you have A of zero, and you know that A of A implies A of A plus one, then you can include A for a generic uh, term, for a generic element. Um, and of course, you can also then conclude the generalization using the for all rule. So uh, this rule exactly captures um, induction. Um, so then the key thing that we have in Piano arithmetic is this delineation of the theory um, by certain fragments. And the fragments are delineated by what's called logical complexity. So again, this is a bit of a, uh, definition but maybe just focus on the second bullet point a sigma n formula um, if you've not seen it before is just one of this form so you have uh, a string of quantifiers beginning with or exists of length n so you have n alternations of quantifiers and then you have a, a formula a the matrix uh, which has only bounded quantifiers so the idea is that this a is a provably recursive predicate in the theory um, and this uh, forms what, uh, and if you look at the sigma n formulas, it forms what's called the arithmetical hierarchy. Each next level is strictly more expressive than the previous level. Um, pi n is defined dually, beginning with for all, and sort of exists. And then an important class are these delta n formulas, which are provably equivalent to both sigma n and pi n. Um, and I'll just finish the slide. Um, and then the theories that delineate piano arithmetic are these theories i sigma n, these ones. And these are exactly the proofs which allow induction only on sigma n formulas. So what do I mean induction only on sigma n formulas? I mean this formula here, the A, which is the induction formula or the inductive invariant. This must be a sigma n form. So um, maybe there are a few definitions here that some people might have seen. So if you've got any questions, this is a good time to pose them. Um, otherwise, I'll continue, but feel free to come back to this. Um, no questions right now, it looks like, so continue. But I encourage anyone, even if you've just got a comment, raise your hand, and then you know, we're happy to, to hear from you. Right. 
Um, okay, so this is the basic setting. So if we think of the original, the original question, which is understanding the power of cyclic proofs, well, we have this delineation of arithmetic and we can ask how much induction do we need to simulate cyclic reasoning? Um, and uh, for this, we need to have um, a cyclic presentation of arithmetic. And this was introduced by uh, Alex Simpson, uh, circa 2011. Um, so he worked in the same language. He works in the same calculus. But instead of an induction rule, he allows um, proof structures to be just normal founded. So uh, a pre-proof is just some infinite derivation tree. Now, when I say infinite, I still mean a, a binary tree. It can just be infinitely deep. But the point is that it's locally correct. So every local proof rule must be a correct instance of a proof rule. Um, and then we have some machinery built up. So the machinery of a precursor. Now, the idea is, if you go through the proof and you're following a branch of your proof, um, you want to uh, start with the term and a precursor of the term is either the same term on, this, on the sequence above it in the branch, or it's something equivalent to it, or um, we're, we allow ourselves to change from a term to a term that that's, uh, explicitly stated to be less than the current term. So it's in the antecedent of the sequence. Uh, and that's what we call a progress point. So um, the basic uh, concept here is the concept of a trace, which follows terms through the branches of proofs. And um, we ask that they uh, progress infinitely often. So infinitely often you switch to a term where that appears uh, less than your previous term in the antecedent. Now, this is a little bit heavy, um, and I'm just going to give an example now. Uh, but the idea is that an infinity proof, or just proof in what follows, is a pre-proof where every infinite branch has such a trace. It has a trace that progresses infinitely often. Now, it turns out this will uh, carve out a sound fragment of the uh, normal founded uh, pre-proofs. Um, but let's just see the definition in action, because I think that will be more illustrative than the definition in text. So let's just go back to um, the previous example that I showed right at the beginning of the talk. So this is a sort of formal slash informal proof, but it's enough to see the trace condition in action. So if you see here, we have exactly one infinite branch in this pre-proof. It's the one that loops on this bullet, keeps going around. Um, and this infinite branch indeed has a progressing trace. So the trace starts with a term and it's gonna start with this term here, the A squared, the, uh, sorry, not that term. Uh, it's actually just going to be A, not A squared. Um, right, so it's just the A. And then you follow the term. Right, oh. Follow to A here, and then I go to A here. But now, notice that I've got this expression C less than A in the antecedent. And this allows me to switch to the C. And then I follow the C. But what happens here is quite interesting because uh, now when I continue the loop, the C doesn't get uh, matched to the A. It actually gets matched to the B this time. And on the next iteration of the cycle, it won't actually um, progress at all. But then on that iteration, it gets matched to the B, which then gets matched to this A. So this trace um, actually ends up uh, progressing on every second cycle. Uh, through uh, second iteration through this cycle, but it isn't infinitely progressing trace. So it has this format here, ACB to the omega, I'm emitting multi multiplicities. Um, so if any questions pop up about this, uh, please pose them. Uh, I hope you get the general idea. Um, I should say that this uh, condition is, um, appears in, in, in many of the works on cyclic proof theories in different guises. So here we're uh, tracing terms. Sometimes you trace formula occurrences. So this, in particular in propositional logic, you trace formula occurrences. Um, so we have some raised hands. I don't know if someone wants to pose a question, Pavel. Yeah, I'm just wondering, can you give an example of a, of a non-infinitely progressing trace? Uh, yes, uh, in this proof. Yeah, so if I took this proof, um, I would actually be allowed to just follow A the whole way and it would be non-infinitely progressing. Um, oh, okay, so, but for the same proof, so that would just be a different... 
there would be a different trace. So, so we argue that there, we demand that there must exist uh, an infinite progressing trace, but not every uh, trace has to be infinite progressing. Okay, thank you. You can also just follow. Um, Right, yeah, so I follow A the whole way. And then let's suppose you have some junk formula on the side everywhere. That includes A, a equals A or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can follow A the whole way. Uh, of course, any proof that is something like this, uh, well, so you could have a proof. Um, and that's like just A, 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 A. This is, I mean, this is the classic fallacious proof, but you can prove anything like this. You just contract and you weaken and you contract and you weaken. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this has no progressing trace whatsoever. Thanks, that's really useful. Okay, good. Um, so, um, like I said, this is similar to many of the other conditions in cyclic proof theory, and, and um, intentionally so. Um, and the key result that I mentioned is that um, this condition uh, is, is, is sufficient for soundness. So if a formula of arithmetic has an infinity proof, then it is true in the standard model, the standard model of natural numbers. So how does this, uh, oh, not full screen, there we are. Um, then it has a proof, then it's true in the standard model. So how does this proof go? Uh, and this is a really, really nice proof uh, that works by contradiction. And this is the same proof in any of uh, the logic, any of the subject matters where there's a standard semantics. Um, so suppose otherwise. Suppose you don't have, suppose there's an infinity proof of a formula that's not true in the standard model. Um, well, since every uh, inference step is locally sound, if the conclusion is false, then one of the premises must be false. And so on and so on and so on. So we can build a branch of invalid sequence along with counter models. And when I say counter models, I just mean assignments uh, of natural numbers to the free variables. Okay. So you can build up this uh, infinite branch of uh, invalid sequence. And because it's an infinite branch and because we're in a proof, uh, by definition, there's an infinitely progressing trace along that branch. Uh, but um, by the construction of this invalid branch and these uh, counter models, these assignments, um, it turns out that this induces an infinitely descending sequence of natural numbers, uh, which is impossible. And that's the proof. So it's, it's quite a nice proof because it's, it's not a priori constructive. It, it goes by contradiction. Um, you don't a priori have a, a, a bound on, on this. Uh, it's not easy. Of course, such a branch doesn't even exist because it is, it is sound after all. So it's, it's got some, it's some interesting uh, content in this proof. And finally, we get to the... Uh, and we have a question from Andy Pitts. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. You're muted. Uh, I've, so yeah, you have to unmute yourself. I've given you. Sorry, I, I'm unmuted now. Right. Uh, yeah. So you half answered the question I was going to ask, which was about constructive content. But it, it's more than just the law of excluded middle. I, I guess there's a dependent choice being used here as well, right? Yeah, I've not done a full um, uh, sort of uh, analysis of this um, myself. This is, uh, but I am. There is some ongoing work with between me and uh, Tom Powell on proof interpretations. And, and, and one of the things we would like to do is maybe uh, pin down exactly what axioms are being used here. Um, but I think this is partially answered, um, maybe, maybe not in, from a constrictivity point of view, but at least in a logical strength point of view, by some of the um, results in this work, which is to say, what can you prove with cyclic proofs and bound it in terms of what you can prove with inductive proofs. So from a re reverse of math mathematics point of view, I sort of, uh, I do uh, attack this question. But not from yeah. a constructivity point of view. Uh, and also, I think from the point of view of constructive content, it's not completely hopeless because um, you might be able to formulate things using um, some form of co induction, as it were, for the cyclic proofs and relate, um, that, the, re relate that to, to ordinary inductive proofs, possibly. Yes, but there's a difference between, um, so I think certainly for the, um, for the proof object itself, I agree. The issue is that the correctness condition is, um, it is the correctness condition that has all the sort of weird infinitary combinatorics and arguing by contradiction stuff going on. Okay, so, thanks. Sorry? Thanks very much, yeah, right. Okay, cool. Please continue. <laughs> Great, uh, but I, I do agree with the point. I think this re analyzing it from a constructive point of view is, is a really interesting thing that I think people, are, we're starting to get glimpses of 
Uh, now, in this work, I study it from a logical strength point of view, from a classical logical, like reverse mechanics point of view. Um, okay, so let's go on. Um, so, uh, yeah, finally, the final definition is the cyclic proofs. And, and um, so, okay, one problem with the infinity proof is exactly this infinity in front of it. They're infinite objects, so they're, they're not, um, not pain, they're, they're, they're quite wild. Um, and in particular, uh, for infinity proofs, you actually have the converse of this sentence, statement. Um, actually, every sentence that's true in the standard model is provable. Um, but we can find a very, very well-behaved uh, finitary fragment, which is the cyclic proofs. So the cyclic or the regular proofs are just those with finitely many distinct subtrees. Uh, formally, it's finitely many distinct subtrees up to renaming of variables. Um, so, uh, and we call cyclic proofs, uh, the theory CA, cyclic rhythmic, just be the theory of sentences that has cyclic proofs. And a particular, an important part of this definition, um, which is implicit, is that um, we can decide when a regular graph, a regular tree, actually satisfies that correctness condition. Um, and the reason is because that correctness condition that I gave, the demanding that there's an infinitely progressing trace, is an omega regular condition. Um, and so you can just uh, define a non-deterministic Buki automaton that recognizes the branches of the pre-proof with infinitely progressing traces and demand that it covers all branches. So we can reduce it to inclusion or universality, if you prefer, of non-deterministic Buki automata, uh, which is of course a p-space complete problem. So um, to summarize here, we have this nice fragment. It is uh, a recursively enumerable theory because the correctness condition is, is checkable. Um, but it still involves a little bit of work to check. Usually checking a proof is just a local thing. It's certainly in polynomial time. Um, this is a little bit, you need a little bit more work here, but it's still uh, quite a nice, um, quite a nice thing. We need to rely on some infinite word automaton theory to, to actually check the proof. So I think because of time, I won't get into the details on the results, but I'm glad that I had this section where I just state the results um, first, and I'll probably do that and then go on to some applications. Um, before I do that, I better talk about what was done before. So of course, this theory of cyclic arithmetic was introduced by Alex Simpson, um, and he wrote a paper in, he published, he published a paper in 2017 uh, with this uh, results. So this is um, essentially the title of the paper, actually, Cyclic Arithmetic is equivalent to Piano Arithmetic. Um, and uh, the tool set for proving this is, is quite nice. It's, um, the idea is, if you know anything about uh, reflection principles in proof theory arithmetic, that's exactly what he does. He formalizes the reflection principle, i.e. the soundness of cyclic uh, proofs itself within uh, Piano arithmetic. Um, and because cyclic proofs deal with a lot of infinite pre-combinatorics, like infinite branches, infinite trees, it's very natural to work in a second order setting where you have variables and quantifiers for infinite sets. Um, and this is very, very well studied in the setting of reverse mathematics, where you have theories such as ACA0, which uh, thankfully are fully conservative over piano arithmetic. So you can prove things in ACA0 uh, about cyclic proofs, and in particular, you can formalize the soundness argument for uh, cyclic proofs. Um, in this setting, and then you know that when you specialize it to arithmetical sentences, for example, concerning the cyclic proofs, the financial proofs, um, piano arithmetic will also uh, prove those um, theorems. Uh, along the way, you have to, in order to prove the soundness, of course, you have to formalize uh, this argument here that I just showed you. So um, we need um, that the correctness of a pre-proof is itself uh, arithmetical. Uh, so PA needs to decide um, the correctness of the proof. And so uh, for that, a lot of uh, basic automaton theory has to be carried out in ACA0, uh, which I'll mention a little bit about later. Um, and like I said, um, the result PA is obtained by conservativity of ACA0 over PA. Um, one big thing is that it's a non-uniform argument. And what I mean by this is uh, you can't formalize the soundness of all of cyclic arithmetic within PA for the same reason that you can't formalize the soundness of all of PA within PA, it reduces to Gödel incompleteness. So instead, what you can do is you can prove the soundness of all proofs up to a certain logical complexity, so all sigma n proofs. Um, and, this, and if this is true for all n, then of course you've just got a simulation. So it's non-uniform because you don't have a universal truth predicate for PA within PA. 
Um, now, in the same year, there was this other work by um, Berardi and Tatuto, which I, I, and I'll rephrase uh, the results they give because it's, it's more pertinent here. Um, they were actually working in, in Brotherston and Simpson's uh, setting of first logical inductive definitions. And they showed that equipped with arithmetic, you can actually show that the cyclic system is uh, simulated by the inductive system. Um, and their argument is completely different. Um, it's a structural argument um, in the sense that they work with low level proof manipulations. That said, you still have a lot of the same infinitary combinatorics in play. So the, that infinitary combinatorics, like um, the versions of uh, the, the Ramsey theorem, are hidden inside some of this basic automaton theory in the, in, in the Simpson proof, which we know also relies on some infinitary combinatorics. Um, uh, and one of the drawbacks of this is so there's a high logical complexity. So in the translation, you, you add lots of quantifiers everywhere. I, I won't go into the details of this, but some in my paper, there's some small analysis of this. So, um, could I ask, could I ask a quick question, um, Anna Pam, about blow up? Yeah. So I, I gather from that, you mean that if you have some inductive proof, uh, sorry, some cyclic proof, and you try and translate that into an inductive proof, then it might blow up in size, right? Um, but there might also be a simpler, inductive proof of that same statement there might be right so are there known to be statements for which the shortest cyclic proof is really shorter than the shortest inductive no no uh, we don't have an example of, we don't have an explicit example of that but i think um modulus and complexity theory conjectures we could, we're pretty close to that um i'll say that in the conclusions but but you believe that that, that would be the case that there would I, be I, I believe it is the case that there are some cyclic proofs that are more succinct in terms of proof size than the shortest possible inductive proof. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, I think Dov Gabay has. Uh, yeah, sure. Go, go, go ahead, Dov. You, you have to unmute yourself. I give you permission to unmute. You'll have to finish the job on your end. You have to unmute. Yes. Relating to your question, when we recognize the recognition of the cyclic proof is a meta level. When you translate or express it in logic, you're bringing meta level into the object level. Yes. And that is, could be more, more complex. I don't know of an example where some things become simpler if you, if you bring meta level into the object level. So probably the answer to you is no. Okay, so maybe to add a few details. So we know that um, the proofs in cyclic arithmetic are at least as big. So, uh, uh, sorry, the proofs in, in, in PA are at least as big as the proofs in CA. There's a polynomial simulation there. Um, so I think, Dov, as you say, the question is um, whether the proofs are as big. Uh, and I, I suspect they're, they're not. I suspect there's a separation. And in fact, there are some recent results that, that suggest that too. And I will make a little bit of progress uh, here because I, I'm aware that we want to finish a little early to leave some time for more questions. Um, but um, just to touch on what Jamie said, which was, what do I mean by blow ups here? There are two parameters in question. So one is uh, here, proof size. So, and that's what we've just been talking about. How does the proof size change? But another parameter is logical complexity, and that's, um, which is also the main subject here, which is, um, if you can prove something with inductive invariants that are sufficiently complex, you know, sigma n inductive invariants in PA, what's the complexity of the invariants that you need in cyclic proofs? Is it the same? Is it different? Um, and that can be seen as a refinement of the Brotherston-Simpson question. So instead of saying, okay, the motto of this theorem here, of, of Simpson's theorem at C equals PA, is that cyclic proofs and inductive proofs are the same, we should instead refine the question and says, and say that, okay, they're the same up to the theorems they prove. But if we look at it with slightly finer glasses, um, how can we distinguish them? And this is exactly what goes on. So um, just like for PA, we can define these fragments of cyclic proofs on sigma n formulas. Uh, and we just demand that it's the proofs that use only sigma n formulas. Uh, and of course, we take the universal closures and we create a bona fide theory in the usual sense out of it. And then uh, we have a number of questions which are sort of rephrasing to what Simpson posed in this original paper. 
Um, how does the logical complexity of C, A, and P, A compare? So in particular, can we say that C sigma M equals I sigma N for appropriately chosen M and N? Um, how does the proof complexity compare? So that's what we were just talking about with Dom and Jamie. Um, what are the, how do the sizes of the proofs compare? Um, and finally, um, a lot of the work that was done, uh, a lot of the things that people observe from a proof search point of view with cycloproofs is that we don't really need to guess clever inductive invariants. We don't need cut as much. Usually we can do without cut. So can we find some non-trivial fragment of the theory where cut admissibility holds? Um, and these are the questions I'll address here. Um, so I will just state the, the res uh, results we have. Before I do that, I think um, there's one particular thing you might conjecture from this result of Simpson, that CA equals PA, which is simply that um, I sigma N equals C sigma N. Especially given the results there, it might be tempting to think that. But actually Simpson already gave a counterexample to this uh, in form of um, the provable totality of the Ackerman Peter function. So I think we, as computer scientists, we all know the Ackerman Peter function. It's a non-primitive recursive yet recursive function given by a very, very simple equational a set of equations like this. Um, because it's recursive, it's uh, expressible using a sigma one formula. It's just the existential formula that um, says that the Turing machine for it uh, terminates and outputs uh, Z in this case. And it turns out that there is a psychoarithmetic proof of its totality. Where um, using only sigma one formulas. Now it's known that this cannot exist. Such a uh, phenomenon cannot happen in Peano arithmetic, because of um, results that tell us that I sigma one can only prove the totality of uh, primitive recursive functions. This is a theorem of Parsons from the 70s. And um, so already we have this distinction. You can see this example as telling us that C sigma one is not equal to I sigma one, despite the fact that because it's in because it's cyclic provable, it must be inductive provable. So the question is, how much logical complexity do we need? Well, here we know it's I sigma two. I sigma two does prove the totality of Ackerman Peter. Uh, is there a general pattern here? Um, and it's exactly this question which uh, I address in this work. And to summarize the, the contributions, um, there's a few different ones, but they can mostly be summarized in one line, which is actually that that generalization holds. C sigma n is exactly equal to I sigma n plus one specialized to the pi n plus one theorems. Um, so it's a complete tight correspondence. You have bounds in both directions, but the proofs in each direction are very, very different. So um, the fact that C sigma n can actually buy you one quantifier complexity is done completely with structural methods. So we manipulate uh, inductive proofs. We have a form of cut elimination, which allows us to tame the logical complexity in the proofs. And then we have a constructive realization of the deduction theorem in order to obtain the result. Of course, the, the main difficulty is in uh, making sure that we achieve the correctness condition for cyclic proofs. Um, and in the other direction, we are inspired by uh, Alex Simpson's arguments, which is to use conservative second order extensions. Um, and we track logical complexity. We have to make a number of uh, specializations and variations and adaptations along the way. Um, one thing that falls out of our approach is that actually we have only an elementary difference in proof size between piano arithmetic and, and cyclic arithmetic. So I think there is still an elementary difference between the proof size, but the difference is um, at most elementary. Um, and the idea behind uh, both this second bullet point and this second theorem is that we can somehow uniformize the soundness argument within PA. Now we can't do it all uniformly because of this problem of truth predicates not existing. For the language of arithmetic, but um, we can do enough of it uniformly to obtain uh, both the complexity bound and the logical complexity bound. Um, and we rely on a few different features, which is just to breeze through, is that if you look at the branch automaton, the automaton that accepts all the infinite branches of a preproof, that turns out to be deterministic. And so acceptance of a for a deterministic automaton is an arithmetical formula. It's not analytic. There are no second order quantifiers. Um, secondly, it's quite important that we um, use only well-foundedness of finite ordinals, i.e. just the natural numbers in this argument, because it allow us to, allows us to talk about, instead of um, acceptance for a non-determinist automaton, an approximation of acceptance, which suffices to carry out the soundness argument and, crucially, is arithmetical. So usually acceptance for a non-determinist automaton is a very logically complex property. It has a second order quantifier. There exists uh, an infant accepting one such that blah, blah, blah. Um, whereas here we can get away with arithmetic formulas. 
Um, so I have some details on, on the proofs, um, but I think in the interest of time, I'm probably gonna skip that. But maybe just to um, show you a picture of something it looks like, of course, in, when you're translating inductive to cyclic proofs, the main interest is the translation of the induction rule. And it looks a little bit like this. And of course, you have to, so you can see that this induction gets transformed into a loop here. And the main thing is to verify that you have an infinite progressing thread. And it turns out that um, you do, oh, oops. Uh, so it's this D, which then progresses to the C, and it goes all the way up this proof and comes up like this. Uh, and so we need as an invariant that this thread, not this thread, this trace doesn't get broken in this subproof. So that's one of the technicalities that, that comes in. Um, now in the other direction, uh, I won't say too much, but like I say, we, we employ uh, the setting of, of reverse mathematics, second order arithmetic, in order to talk about omega word automata. Um, so the particular theory, working theory, is this theory called RCA0, which is like um, ACA0, but for I sigma 1 instead. So you can see it as the second order theory that captures primitive recursive arithmetic. Um, and fortunately, very recently, there have been some results studying exactly the logical strength of omega automaton theory in uh, setting in second order uh, arithmetic. Um, and it's this um, nice result of Kolodziejczyk, Michalewski, Pradik, and Skripczak in 2016. Uh, and they showed that RCA0 with sigma 2 induction can actually show the complementation, uh, can actually prove the complementation result for non deterministic Suzuki automata. It can prove that some recursive construction, AC, actually computes the complement language uh, of, an auto of the automaton A. Right. Uh, and it's really interesting that they use the sigma 2 induction. They actually show converse too. So it's really a, a nice result in reverse mathematics. They show that the complementation, um, this complementation result is equivalent to sigma two induction. So it's a complete characterization, uh, which is really, really nice because it shows you that there must be some sort of infinite combinatorics involved. When we talk about sigma two induction, we're talking about things like the infinite pigeonhole principle uh, and other beasts like this. So it's quite nice. Um, but another interesting thing, which is not uh, explicit in their paper um, is, is this, um, degeneralization of it. So if you take this for all quantifier here and you move it to the meta level, it turns out you can get you can actually do the whole thing with uh without with only sigma one induction. Um so you have a non-uniform you have a family of theorems for each one theorem for each automaton saying that the explicit uh complement automaton computes the complement language of the automaton given but it's a family of theorems it's not a single theorem. Um, and this is really uh, surprising because the argument is done um, by induction on the number of colors uh, in a, uh, so the argument uses a form of uh, Ramsey's theorem by induction on the number of colors, which usual forms of Ramsey's theorem cannot be proved by. You cannot prove uh, Ramsey's, the infinite Ramsey theorem by induction on colors, but the form that you require, the additive Ramsey theorem can be. So, so there is an alternative, um, and explicit proof of this in, in, in my work, if you're interested. Uh, but I think it's fair to say it's implicit in this work that I've cited. Um, and it's not trivial. So I think it's a really, really nice um, observation that we can do this. Um, in itself, it's already interesting. Um, and this is what allows us to um, get our results. So I will ignore um, the details, but if I just uh, give you this corollary at the end, um, the fact the upper bound on logical complexity and the upper bound in proof complexity are respectively obtained from these two displays. So the fact that you can um, prove this result with only sigma two induction gives us the proof complexity bound. And the fact that we have a degeneralization with less logical complexity gives us the logical complexity bound, this second one. Um, so I think, um, so I won't take any questions for now if there are any, because I'll, I'll try to wrap up first. Um, so I just want to give some further results. Now, because um, we have a bit more uniformity in this, we actually gain a metamathematical account of the theory of cyclic arithmetic. Um, now, that might be meaningless to some people, but what I do want to do is give an application of that, which, is, could, which could be interesting in its own right. So we can show uh, that actually the consistently, consistency of cyclic reasoning is bounded below and above by uh, I sigma n plus one and I sigma n plus two. This follows by just formalizing the results of this work. 
So this really gives us a sort of uh, reverse mathematical account of, cyclic, of the strength of cyclic reasoning. Exactly how strong is it to reason with sigma n formulas cyclically? Well, it's somewhere in between sigma n plus one inductive reasoning and sigma n plus two inductive reasoning. Uh, and this is tight. Uh, and as a result of this, we immediately have, um, for example, the failure of cut admissibility, which reduces simply to a, um, this form of girdle incompleteness. So this lower bound is a direct from girdle incompleteness from our simulations. Um, and so um, the class of cyclic proofs with only sigma n minus one cuts is, isn't even complete for sig uh, c sigma n. So this is already a nice observation. But what's more, um, we have a curious application of, these, of this mathematical account to something that has nothing to do with cyclic proofs, uh, which is the reverse mathematics of some automata theory, in particular, McNaughton's theorem. So if you know um, if you, some omega automata theory, you probably come across this. Uh, McNaughton's theorem states that every non-deterministic Buki automaton has an equivalent deterministic parity or, or Rabin or Muller automaton. And this statement, um, or at least I should say a natural formulation of this statement, is not provable in RCA0. And this was a question that was left open in the previous work that I mentioned of um, uh, Kolodzieszek Mikhailovsky Pradik and Scripture. Um, and the point is, it turns out that if, you, if it was provable, you could actually do all our arguments with one less quantifier complexity. And so you would contradict Gödel's incompleteness theorem for cyclic groups. Um, and so we immediately get this as a, so this kind of just falls out of our work. Now there's probably some direct proof hiding in there that doesn't use cyclic groups at all, but I thought this was a quite nice application. Um, <clears throat> And so this was a, a nice sort of application of these results that was not known before. Uh, right, so to conclude, um, so before I give conclusions, it's, uh, it's an ad time for an ad break. So um, I'd like to talk about this, which is a recent initiative I launched um, towards the beginning of the pandemic, uh, along with uh, Tom Powell and a handful of other contributors. It's the Proof Theory blog, the link is up here. Uh, and this is, we hope, um, going to be a vibrant online forum for discussions about proof theory. Um, everyone's welcome to participate, that you can post comments, you can contribute to the resources, you can contribute posts. Um, if you are interested, just get in touch. Uh, all the details are on the page. Um, I'm just going to, I can't switch to it, but uh, anyway, this is the link and we have several contributors already. We would love to have some more, so please consider um, reading, participating, contributing, uh, whatever you like. So uh, to summarize, we get an optimal logical complexity. We characterize this um, cyclic proofs with sigma n formulas as precisely i sigma n plus one, or at least the pi n plus one consequences of i sigma n plus one. Uh, and we get this um, fact the proof complexity differs only elementarily. Uh, in fact, uh, I said elementary, but in fact, the elementary function is very simple. It's exponential. Um, so it does exponentially simulate CA. And this is optimal unless there's a more efficient way to check cyclic proof sound. So that exponential um, just comes down to the fact that uh, you have to be able to uh, do that proof, that, that correctness condition, uh, but that correctness condition is p-space complete. Uh, so no proof can be of, there's no polynomial size proof for uh, any two automata checking inclusion, because that would give you an NP algorithm for p-space. So unless NP equals p-space, of course, I should say. Uh, and in fact, this now seems very unlikely because of the recent result by uh, Remy Nollet, Alexis Zohar, and Christine Tasson, who showed p-space completeness of the correctness condition in a different logic, which I suspect uh, scales to arithmetic too. So um, I would say that this is probably optimal, but um, the details must be done. Um, future work, um, so lots of people are doing really interesting future work, so I, I don't have time to talk about it all, but just on my side, I think the I said right at the beginning that there's so many different worlds of cyclic proof theory now. And one of the things I'm trying to do with people I'm working with is to try and bridge some of these worlds. So there's a lot of work in predicate logic and there's a lot of work in type systems. And in traditional proof theory, we have very well understood um, translations between these two worlds, namely proof interpretations, like Gödel's dialectic of functional interpretation. Um, and one particular question that I would like to, that I'm looking at right now with Tom Powell is to, um, instantiate this for cyclic proofs. Um, another question, which is uh, in the 2000s, when Brotherston and Simpson originally started looking at inductive definitions with personal logic, they only worked with what other 
ordinary conductor definitions. So these are really just uh, least fixed points that have closure ordinal omega, uh, less than omega, and they're quite simple. But of course, there are extensions of arithmetic with much more complex inductive definitions, such as, for example, theories like ID1, ID less than omega, which are of profound importance in proof theory. Um, these have much more complex closure ordinals with fixed points um, needing to be unfolded, perhaps up to the church cleaning ordinal in order to converge. Um, and this is a really nice setting because in this setting, the closure ordinal, the fixed points, is distinct from the proof theoretic ordinal, unlike the setting arithmetic. The proof theoretic ordinal is much, much lower. So you have some interesting questions there. I should also mention this recent work of Berardi and Hatsuta in 2018, where they um, proposed to extend uh, first logic with inductive and co-inductive Markov nerve definitions. Um, and, and, and I think this is also an interesting uh, subject area. So I will finish there. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Anapam. Okay, so I'm now going to unmute everybody and then we can applaud. Okay. Great. So the applause is over. Do we have any questions for Anapam now? Please raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, in the meantime, I have a question about cyclic proofs versus co-inductive proofs. Is there anything interesting to say there? Um, so I, I don't know what you exactly mean by co-inductive proof, but I think the main thing here is the sure. I mean, the main thing here is the correctness condition. Sure. I mean, um, naively, I mean, naively, the dis the distinction between an inductive and a co-inductive structure is whether we have the least fixed point or the greatest fixed point of the constructors, right? I mean, obviously, then co-inductive structures can have inverse instances. So that accounts for the data structure of cyclic proofs. So if you think okay. of the infinity proofs, the infinity pre-proofs as just being co-inductively generated from the proof rules as opposed to inductively generated from proof rules, that, that is a correct account of the infinity pre-proofs. But then on top of that, it's the, the termination condition or the correctness condition, um, which is bespoke. And you could ask for different conditions um, rather than just the progressing trace condition. Um, but it, 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 it's that what, which, is, which distinguishes the, the proofs of this work, the normal found proofs of this work from other normal founded pre-proofs. And I had a question about regularity as well. Could there be uh, well-founded non-regular? That, that's an excellent question. Um, yes, is, is the answer. And actually, um, it's not in this work, but you could also read this work as saying, if you, this, all these results would hold, but any uh, sig instead of C sigma n, you could look at the sigma n infinity proofs uh, that have some uh, certificate provable that verifies its soundness provably in uh, arithmetic, provably in say I sigma one. And this accounts for lots and lots of different proofs, uh, not just the cyclic ones. So as long as you're finitely representable and you can prove that there's an infinite progressing trace along the infinite every infinite branch in your theory, then the whole thing works. So in this case, we just show that C sigma n does have that property. In, in particular, the correctness can be checked in RCA zero, but the result holds for any uh, class of sigma n proofs whose correctness is checkable in RCA zero. Mm -hmm. uh, Dov, go ahead. Dov has raised his hand. Oh, his hand has gone down again. Dov, do you have a question? Uh, so you have to click un unmute. Dov, you, you're muted. So I've given you permission to unmute. Yeah, go ahead, Don. It's not a mathematical question, but I think it's a, a interesting one. You know, with uh, predicate prey cycles, like you have sheep eating grass, and then there's more sheep and less grass, and then the sheep die, and then there's more grass, and then uh, you, you know, it's a it's a it's a cycle which reaches an equilibrium. Enough sheep and enough grass to to have a steady state. Right now, you you can unfold it as a, a infinite infinite loop, and then you have a fixed point, which is fine. I can see an, an analogy, but some of these some of these um, um, uh, a predicate prey may have more than one equilibrium point. Uh, so, how does it 
Do you have any idea, uh, any anything to say how it might relate yeah, here? Yes, um, at, at least thematically, I think this, this might address your question, which is, um, okay, so it, it, imagine we have a setting, we have a logic with um, not just least fixed points, but least fixed point, greatest fixed points, and whatever. So for example, like the modal mu calculus, you have both least fixed points and greatest fixed points. Now in that setting, the distinction between the fixed points is much clearer because the progressing thread condition or trace condition that they use actually uh, has to, uh, is the way you distinguish the two fixed points. The, the progress has to be on a greatest fixed point on the right or least fixed point on the left. And so you can distinguish the two fixed points using um, the machinery, this, this sort of machinery of progressing traces, progressing traces. Oh, I see. So when you go, when you go to infinity, you have a choice. When you look one step to the next step, you have a choice where to concentrate on? I'm, I'm not sure I'm addressing um, at a low level your question, but I, I'm saying that there, the, the idea that there are different fixed yeah. points around does present in, in, in cyclic proof theory. And there are ways of distinguishing at least the least and the greatest fixed points. Um, you talked about uh, processes that reach uh, an equilibrium. And I think something that could be interesting that I've not seen anyone do so far is looking at things like um, probabilistic temporal logics, you know, that, whose models are Markov chains, who, who, which do reach fixed points. Um, and there could be some interesting cyclic proof theory to be done there, but I don't know if anyone's done anything. Um, but I think that maybe resembles a lot yeah, more. Yeah, sort of yeah, 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 yeah. You're probably right. I think uh, that's the right idea. Yes, I can see. Yeah, um, so, so we have another question from Elio La Rosa. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, just a quick question. So um, I was wondering if this approach, uh, because like from the example you gave, it seems like to be uh, cogent, this thing can, can be replaced instead of using, by using uh, induction in this, in this form of sigma calculus, by using epsilon calculus, by uh, basically interpreting arithmetic with, with the critical formulas that are interpreted as uh, the least, um, um, the, the least, uh, elements satisfying uh, a given formula. So if you can have like the, 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 all the benefits of epsilon calculus and, and have this, this, this kind of cycles in this, this kind of setting. I think that's an interesting question, but I, I, um, so, so something I, I'm not aware of is um, the relative strength of things like epsilon terms and minimization principles. So if you think of minimization principles, which are things like saying the least x such that this formula holds, if such an x exists at all, uh, which is, you know, we know traditionally is equivalent to induction, although you, yes. you, know, you gain some a logical complexity. Uh, I'm, I'm not really aware of the, the relative strength of that principle and the existence of epsilon terms. So, so maybe I'm not the right person to ask it, but it sounds like that's what you're asking about. Yes, also, yes. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no further questions, let's... I, can, I just wanted to follow one thing. So I, I realized on Jamie's question, um, I said that this holds for more general classes of cyclic proofs, but I also then want, I think there's an elephant in the room, which is why do we care about the cyclic proofs at all out of all the finitely presentable fragments? And one thing I will say in defense of them is that um, I think a lot of really interesting methodological results fall out quite nicely with the cyclic presentation. And in particular, this works in stuff like the modal mu calculus or, or proposition logics where um, there's this lovely recent paper by um, Afshari and Lay, uh, which gives uh, an, inter I don't know if it's published actually, but it's a result of this, which gives an interpolation argument for the new that was completely proof theoretic that works because of cyclicity of the proof search space. Um, so because of that cyclicity, you can express the proof search space using the fixed point constructors of the logic. And so you have this nice interplay between the expressivity of the logic and the expressivity of the proof structure. Thanks, Adam. Paul Taylor, did you want to uh, come in? Yeah. Um, uh, so, Anupam, you know that, that I'm uh, much more um, much more interested in semantic things and um, uh, symbolic things are really not my thing. Now, there's, there's some. There's, so, what you 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 present everything in a in a very symbolic setting, um, but the cyclicity. Um, it means that most of the symbols are irrelevant, and what's actually relevant is the is the geometrical structure of all the symbols going on. 
Yes. In, in a way, you? in a way, yes. Um, I wonder. I wonder whether there's, uh, there's some way in which in which you could ex abstract out the cyclicity of it, um, and and try and clear away the symbols, um, so that the ideas can be brought into a form where you know people who think in you know think mathematically in different ways uh, might might have something to say about it. So I think. Um if I understand you correctly, I can point to a lot recent line of work, which is particularly relevant, um, by um, Alexis Soha and uh, Abhishek D, uh, which is on proof nets for cyclic proofs. In particular, they, they look at a, a simple logic, uh, new, new MML, so multiplicative linear logic with least and greatest fixed points. And they try to do precisely what you were saying. They try to abstract out all the syntax in the just like usual proof nets. And of course, they try to reconstruct many of the basic results like half elimination, um, the correctness condition, or at the level of proof net, so without syntax in a more semantic sense. Um, is that the sort of thing you're after? Um, possibly, if I knew what that was. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, mean, I mean, if you, it, when, once you start doing things in a diagrammatic way, you could follow the sort of direction that, that, uh, that Jamie does of. Um, of taking things that that we understand in one dimension to to higher dimensions, I have absolutely no idea where that might go. Um, and how do you want to respond to, to Paul's final points? Uh, no, 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 I I don't think I I didn't fully understand it to be honest. Well, maybe we could take it to the discussion anyway. Um, so thanks, Anna Pam, for a fantastic talk and lots of interesting interaction. And we'll finally uh, do an unmute and clap. <laughs>